Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Matt Smith, and I'm the director of training at Corvell. Today's webinar is entitled COVID-19 in the new year. And as the COVID-19 pandemic continues in 2021, I know we're all interested in receiving up-to-date and accurate information on the disease and its impact on workers and occupational settings, as well as the symptoms and treatment of the virus, and of course, the vaccine. So I'm happy to introduce our presenters today. Before I do so, I would like to let everyone know that we are recording today's call and we will make that recording available to everyone after the uh, call is completed. You can see the Q&A pane in the lower right hand of your screen. And Diane Blaha, our Chief Marketing Officer, will be monitoring the Q&A pane throughout the call and we'll take as many questions as we can when we conclude the presentation. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists today. Michelle Tucker is the Vice President of Enterprise Comp. She's been with Corvell since 2009 and has over 30 years of claim experience. Michelle is responsible for the technical and quality oversight of claims nationally for Corvell. Dr. Robert Blink is a board certified and fellow in the College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. He chairs the National Credentialing and Quality Assurance Committee for Corvell leads the employee health services for a large number of hospitals and has widespread consulting roles. Ryan Hamm is Corvell's clinical pharmacist and joined Corvell in 2019. He graduated with his pharmacy doctorate from Ohio Northern University in 2014 and practiced in long-term care pharmacy for five years before joining Corvell. He works with our clinical team in the Corvell Pharmacy Solutions Department to provide clinical support and ensure the best outcomes for our clients and injured workers. And Dr. Madeline Azar Kavanaugh is Corvell's medical director for our virtual medical clinic. She is board certified and a fellow in the College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. She has been practicing occupational medicine for over 30 years as a medical director in hospital as well as corporate health settings. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michelle to begin our presentation. Oh, thank you, Matt. Much appreciated. And good morning and afternoon, depending on where you're located. And certainly, Happy New Year. Um, hoping that, you know, 2021, we see a lot less activity in regards to COVID-19. Um, we thought we would start today with just covering some updated statistics specifically related to Corvell. We've talked about these uh, statistics on some of our earlier webinars and thought it would be important maybe just to update the information. Um, currently, Corvell has uh, just about 14,500 COVID claims we've received. That's inclusive of both work comp and general liability. Of course, the predominance by far is um, under workers comp. We have seen a volume increase, primarily continuing in the Midwest. Certainly we've seen some um, volume increase in California. Unfortunately, we've seen about a 20% increase in claim volume specific to COVID in Q4 of 2020. So not unusual. Um, probably not any different than it's been experienced nationally, but um, our numbers are certainly um, trending the same. 62% um, of the work comp claims that we've received and 81% of the liability claims that we've received since March, which is really when we began to get COVID claims, have been closed. So the preponderance and the majority of cases, again, are closing relatively quickly. Um, we continue to see primary industries, as you would expect, affected by COVID, um, about 40%, just around 40%. Um, public entity, first responders, emergency uh, providers, about 33% is healthcare, social workers, nursing, um, care facilities, et cetera. Um, where we did see an increase in Q4 was in the retail sector specifically. Um, about a 5% increase we saw in Q4 related to retail and grocers. That may have been related to some of the holiday shopping, um, additional staff working during the holidays, et cetera, but we did see some increase in that sector during Q4. And then the remainder is um, a mix of industries, finance, insurance, et cetera, that falls under the remainder of the percentage for COVID. Um, as you would expect also, 70% of the employees with COVID fall in the age range of 37 to 56. And again, um, that would be expected. That's the work general workforce. Not, so not a lot of um, employees under the age of 37 and certainly not um, as many over the age of 56. Our average work comp claim cost 
across our entire book of business is running just under $2,400, which um, is less than the national average, which continues to be pretty significant. And that is a blend of both um, what we would consider medical only, so no lost time situations or exposure cases up to the most severe inclusive of death claims, of course. Our average GL claim cost is running about 6,500. And thankfully, um, we continue to see very small percentage of severity. So less than 1% of our total work comp claims have cost over $75,000. So very small number of, of severe cases. All right, next slide. Wanted to just talk briefly, again, just to give you kind of a broad overview of questions and um, trends that we're seeing. Um, we still see about 19 states with presumptions or legislative changes related to COVID. California, um, as many of you may be aware, uh, has been the most recent that made some sweeping changes in Q4 of 2020. Corvell did host two separate webinars um, to address some of those legislative changes. If you were not able to attend, please reach out to us. Those were recorded and we're happy to provide you with a copy of those recordings. We are getting lots of questions about the implications of um, having a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination program, both from obviously the healthcare sector, but from all sectors. So we've done some broad investigation nationally. We continue to look um, jurisdictionally at case law and established uh, compensability. Um, what would be the implications of a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination program? Thus far, I would say the preponderance of the jurisdictions would create um, work comp exposure or liability if you mandate COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, some jurisdictions are silent, so could result in ultimately some litigation if that's necessary. We are compiling that information in case law um, documentation and we will provide that. Um, to you on our Corvell.com website. We'll have a listing of what we've been able to collect thus far and the results of our investigation. But again, certainly something to consider if you're, if you're discussing creating a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policy. We do know that schools um, are looking across the country at mandating COVID-19 vaccinations, both, both for their teachers and staff and for students. And this could also create an additional liability exposure, not only for work comp, but also from a liability standpoint. So what I would say to all of you just quickly in closing is make sure that you have a policy and that you have sought specific jurisdictional legal advice if you're looking at creating either a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policy or even a voluntary policy. If you're looking at offering um, vaccines on site, and I think that's great. Um, I would recommend, again, seeking legal advice in regards to the need for um, securing a release, indicating that the vaccination is voluntary um, and addressing the liability if um, a receiver of the vaccine may suffer some type of a subsequent reaction um, or um, other issue might come up in regards to the vaccine. Um, so again, that's just kind of a quick uh, review of what some information. I think what's most important here is that we have some great subject experts really on the medical side. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Dr. Blink. Thank you. Well, good morning or good afternoon as the case may be. Um, so thanks for having me today. We're gonna to be talking briefly about treatment of COVID-19 infection. And uh, we will not be going into deeply into hospitalized patients. That's, of course, quite complex. And uh, the hospital physicians are going to be doing what's necessary to save lives and to treat people who have the most severe disease. But for those um, who are outpatient, the first thing to recognize is that COVID-19, the SARS-2-CoV virus has uh, widespread effects in the body. And this is because it has an affinity and it gets into our cells via the ACE2 receptor, which is distributed in a lot of different tissues. And that includes the lungs, the heart, kidneys, the brain, 
gastrointestinal tract, the blood and, uh, well, blood effects actually have to do with hypercoagulability. And then there are some skin effects due to circulation problems. But um, of course, the most common effects are uh, fever, cough, and just general debilitation um, amongst those who, who have uh, COVID infection symptoms. Of course, a fair number of people, roughly half overall, get infected and have none. And the remainder, uh, a lot of people have quite mild symptoms and the treatment is really just symptomatic as you would for a cold or the flu. However, there are, of course, are people with much more severe problems, and we'll get into that. I can have the next slide, please. So one way to break down uh, COVID-19 disease is by the duration of the infection. So the acute phase is usually about two weeks, but it can certainly give you symptoms for longer. And roughly four weeks into an infection, we consider that to be a, um, the, the acute phase transitioning to a subacute or a persistent phase. And um, at that point, treatment uh, becomes uh, more necessary. Again, for these are for non-hospitalized patients. This is a good point to point out, a good time to point out that um, one needs to be vigilant for the need for monoclonal antibodies. Um, there are two commercial products that have emergency use authorization, and these are antibodies against the coronavirus spike protein. There's also hyperimmune serum, which is uh, taken from people who have recovered from the virus, and um, those kinds of entities can be used. It's still somewhat controversial. The data is not fully in as to exactly how effective they are, but um, it does appear that there is usefulness. In fact, it may be life-saving. So the monoclonal antibodies need to be given for people who are diagnosed with COVID and have a positive COVID test, who are still within the first 10 days of treatment, and who are at increased risk of severe disease, either by virtue of age or underlying medical conditions or by the course of their illness and you want to get it to them as soon as possible. The idea here is to try to neutralize the virus before it even enters the cells fully during one of its replication cycles. So we want to keep that in mind, and those who are tasked with treating patients, uh, we don't want to miss this. Actually, giving the antibodies is somewhat arduous. It has to be done intravenously. There are side effects to the infusion. And um, it, it's a bit complicated. So frankly, we're probably giving out a lot less than we should. In the uh, other things to be treating in this uh, subacute area are, of course, cough and your traditional treatments for that with um, cough suppressants and bronchodilators and perhaps inhaled steroids are uh, important. And then debilitation can be quite a problem. If people have just been laying in bed for weeks or even perhaps months. Of course, muscles get weak, and um, then you have your psychological symptoms, which can be quite severe. Uh, something like 15 to 87 percent of patients who were hospitalized with COVID wind up with continuing problems of fatigue. It's obviously, it's a wide range, so it gives you an idea of how hard it is to track some of these, but still quite a few people. Trouble breathing, discomfort when breathing, anywhere from 10 to 71 percent has been recorded. Chest pain or tightness, anywhere from 12 to 44 percent, and cough, uh, roughly a fifth or a quarter of patients have these continuing symptoms. There's a whole lot of other different symptoms that continue for quite some time. Um, muscle pain uh, is quite common, and then other psychological effects, depression and um, memory loss and trouble concentrating uh, can be quite persistent. So um, finally, in the Last phase, we're talking about sequelae. So this is something like three months in or six months in. These are the people that are also called long COVID or long haulers. Um, the nomenclature for this disease is still evolving. But essentially, these are people who the virus is long gone, but the effects that it's had on the body persist. And these can be quite troubling. Uh, some of them are seemingly minor, like loss of taste and smell, but I guarantee you that if it's actually you that's lost your taste and smell, 
This is a serious blow to quality of life. And indeed, quality of life is seen to be considerably worse for people recovering from COVID and similar illnesses such as the say the flu, where even with the same severity up front, there's at least 50% more quality of life deficits for those recovering from COVID-19. Next slide, please. So then finally, in addition to treatment, we're all concerned about making sure that people are able to maximize their function in life. This is not only important economically and in terms of um, how an employer might view the situation, but for one's own well-being, being employed and being functional and being able to do what you want in life is critical. And so just like we do in many other fields, especially in workers' compensation, but in other areas also, being able to encourage people to get back to their usual activity is generally good for them. Uh, in this disease, unlike what we may do in some other realms where we understand the disease better, um, encouraging people has to be very judicious because these are more or less inapparent deficits, sort of like chronic fatigue syndrome. In fact, it may indeed be one of the sequelae of COVID where it's, you really can't see much. So you have to do a good job of listening to the patients and making sure that you are taking care of them at the same time, encouraging them to increase what they're doing. So some of the techniques we use for people who have continued debilitation are professional um, treatments with occupational therapy, physical therapy, respiratory therapy, and for those who have more severe functional problems, possibly even things like speech therapy and, uh, of course, psychological support. Uh, the rehabilitation has a goal of increasing people's activity, whatever they can tolerate. Physically, it's good to have people, even if they're feeling very bad, as long as they've actually gotten out of the woods and they're no longer in danger of having a secondary infection, to encourage their activities of getting up and out of bed and walking and doing whatever they're able to do to gradually increase activity, much as you would after a physical illness. And then for those who are looking at return to work or where that's a concern, uh, looking at ways to do modified duty, such as half-time work or some decreased um, stress in, in the work assignments, if that's something that's available. So essentially ramping people up to their normal level of activity is very important. So to summarize, uh, COVID-19 infection can be quite severe. It has a wide range of types of effects on various body systems, and we may be called upon to judge whether various treatments are required or not. And it's important to realize that almost any body system might be affected, and each request should be evaluated appropriately. As far as return to work, we just want to gradually increase people's activity as tolerated and encourage them to keep on going. Uh, indeed, only a small portion of people are permanently um, debilitated in terms of employment, although there certainly are some. So thanks for listening. I'll turn this over to Ryan Hamm. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Ryan Hamm. I'm our clinical pharmacist with Corvell. Um, today, I was just going to cover some thing things with the COVID vaccines, um, how they work, some of the side effects, how effective they are and how we go about handling them. So vaccines are very important for any disease. They're one of the number one tool in modern medicine to help eradicate diseases and especially battle ongoing pandemics. Um, how do they work? They train the body to recognize a distinctive part of the, the virus or bacteria so that the body will immediately respond and prevent infection if the actual pathogen enters the body at a later time. Um, next slide, please. There are several different types of COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the first kind is our genetic vaccines. So they actually train the body to, I'm sorry, they deliver genetic material from the pathogen like a COVID-19 virus into the human host cells to provoke an immune response into the host. Um, example of this are the messenger RNA vaccines. A second type is the viral vector vaccines. These are bioengineered uh, non-COVID viruses that contain COVID-19 viral genes that enter a host cell. And 
similarly, the genetic material is used by the host cell to produce a viral response, um, an immune response. The third kind are protein vaccines. These have been around a lot longer. These are these contain viral protein particles, but no virus or genetic material. And the body will recognize them as foreign and invoke immune response. Then the last type being developed are attenuated or inactivated vaccines. These are actually created from either live or weakened COVID-19 viruses or killed ones. Next slide, please. Um, so just in, with the update, what is an emergency use authorization? This is what the FDA is giving to be able to have these used. So an emergency use authorization or an EUA is not a full FDA approval. It allows the FDA to authorize vaccines and medications before full approval to allow access to them in times of great crisis. Um, there are certain approval criteria for these. One of them is that the known benefits of the therapy must outweigh the known risks. And the other one is that no other similar preventative therapies can already be approved by the FDA and available on the market for use. Next slide, please. So there have been a few recent authorizations in the United States for COVID vaccines. Uh, the two main ones are Pfizer and Moderna. Pfizer um, was authorized recently on 12, 11, 20. It's said to be 95% effective at preventing COVID-19 infections. This is based on the results of an ongoing clinical trial with over 37,000 different participants. Um, it was an international trial, but most of them were in the US. And then Moderna was authorized shortly after that on 12, 18, 20. It's said to be 94% effective at preventing COVID infection. So very similar to Pfizer. Um, it is based on the results of another ongoing clinical trial with over 28,000 participants. One thing, that, one important thing to note about these vaccines is that the effects on transmissibility of the disease or the ability of a person with COVID who has received the vaccine to actually pass it on to someone else is still unknown at this point. Therefore, even though someone's been vaccinated, people are still gonna need to practice all the same safe public health measures that they've been practicing for the last several months. So social distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, all of those will still need to be, to be practiced to help battle the spread. These are both mRNA vaccines, so genetic vaccines like I talked about earlier. This is a fairly new vaccine technology, although it's been studied for over 10 years. Um, what's happening with these is you get the vaccine, it's inserting a piece of the viral genetic code into the host human cells. Um, it's the part of the code that's responsible for producing the spike protein, which is on the outside of the virus. That's the part of the virus that allows the, um, it to attach to and infect your, your human host cells. This causes the host cells to produce a spike protein, only no other viral components. Um, this will in turn allow the body to recognize this and it will invoke immune response against this so that if the body would be infected with it at a later point, it will fight it right away. Next slide, please. So in terms of the safety profile, there are some side effects uh, with these vaccines. They're similar among both vaccines. The most common ones that we're seeing among both are fever, chills, muscle or joint pain, injection site pain, some swollen lymph nodes, um, fatigue, headache, and nausea. Some of these can actually last up to multiple days. One important thing to note about this is more side effects are seen with the second injection than the first. So you can expect to a more res response from that one. And Another important thing to note is there are some rare cases of anaphylaxis or a severe allergic reaction. So patients that have had allergies to things before, we wanna be really cautious of that. And lastly, this, this vaccine hasn't been studied in every patient group. Um, they really haven't been studied in children. Both of the authorizations are for, I think, 15 and 16 and over. There's other groups like pregnant women and other ones that really haven't been studied. So that's just something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. There are some differences between these vaccines. Um, one of the big, one of the bigger differences is the dosing schedule. So while both vaccines are two doses, um, the schedule is a little different. So with Pfizer, the two doses are actually given 21 days apart. With Moderna, it's just a little bit longer. So they're given 28 days apart. And the 90% immunity that you're seeing with these is really not achieved until at least usually seven days after the second dose. 
So that, that's really when you get the full effect of the vaccine. Another big difference is the storage, stability, and distribution of the vaccine. You know, storing it, getting it, storing it somewhere on a truck, getting it to the actual population. So with Pfizer, it's a bit more challenging. Uh, it's required to be frozen at a really cold temperature, negative 70 degrees Celsius or negative 4, 94 degrees Fahrenheit. So that requires special freezers, special distribution centers, special trucks. And once it's actually thawed out for use in the refrigerator, it's only good for five days. So that means you really have to use it right away. And there's a higher uh, chance of wasting them if they're, if they're not able to be used right away. With Moderna, it's not as challenging. Um, it is still required to be frozen, but only at regular freezer temperature, which is about negative 20 degrees Celsius or negative four degrees Fahrenheit. And once it's thawed in the refrigerator, it's actually good up to 30 days. So pharmacies, distribution centers, they can keep these around a lot longer and make sure it's all used up. Next slide, please. So with the, with the availability of the vaccine, it's gonna be limited at first. Um, a lot of this is due to limited supply at first and trying to get the priority groups vaccinated first. So the federal and state governments have been determining which groups are prioritized to receive the vaccine first. This does differ by state. In general, the most high priority groups are healthcare workers directly caring for COVID patients, think in hospitals, um, first responders, and another big group is both staff and elderly residents at long-term care facilities, since we've seen such a large percentage of the mortality rate or death in this country at long-term care facilities. After that, the next groups uh, will be groups such as other healthcare workers, um, elderly patients, other high risk groups, such as patients with pre-existing conditions, um, other essential workers, especially teachers and getting children back to school. Once all those groups have been vaccinated, um, they'll move on to probably the general population. Most sources that I've seen indicate that the rest of the general population will likely be able to get vaccinated, hopefully um, in the spring to summer of 2021. And regarding the vaccines, there is help on the way, even though we have these two authorizations right now, it's likely that we'll have more vaccine candidates authorized soon. As more of these are authorized, there'll be more of a vaccine supply. So there shouldn't be as such a bottleneck of getting it out and there should be more available. Um, two of the big ones that are, might be might coming up soon are the ones from Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. In fact, AstraZeneca has been authorized in some other countries recently. These are both slightly different than the viral vector vaccines I talked about. So those are some of the two bigger ones that might be coming up. And then there's several other as well that might be coming up this year. Next slide, please. So at Corvell, we have a lot of vaccine solutions that we have available to us. Um, in terms of accessibility, vaccines are commonly given at pharmacies. You know, I know CVS and Walgreens and other companies have signed up to be a part of this. In addition to other places such as healthcare centers, hospitals, and vaccine clinics. Vaccines are a, a large component of certain workers' comp claims, such as exposure claims, but not every claim. Um, we can offer customized solutions. So we do have the ability to provide the COVID-19 vaccinations from the convenience of pharmacies nationwide through use of the pharmacy card. Um, clients can decide if they want to allow COVID vaccines to pay on the pharmacy card for the claimants. Um, lastly, just to talk about the vaccine cost, Initially, um, during this first phase, the federal government will be covering the ingredient cost of the vaccine. And if plan sponsors are covering it, they would be expected to pay the administration cost, which is usually between 16 and $28 per shot. And with that, um, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Cavanaugh. Hi, th thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking about COVID-19 testing. Um, as some of you may know, there are two types of testing for COVID-19, also known as SARS-CoV-2. There are virus testing and antibody testing. Virus testing tells you if you're currently shedding the virus, while the antibody testing shows if you have had the virus. There are two different methods of virus testing. One of these is the RNA testing and the other is antigen testing. Of those, the RNA is more accurate in general. The PCR RNA test has a very high sensitivity, which means that there are almost no false positives and has a relatively few false negatives, the specificity. The COVID-19 home collection kit done in partnership with One Health is performed by viral PCR testing 
and it has almost 100% accuracy. This kit allows for companies to safely return employees to work. The kits are prepackaged and can be distributed by employers or sent directly to individuals. The kit allows for at-home self-collection using a saliva sample to determine if the individual is shedding the COVID-19 virus or any of its mutations. The kit comes with an easy to follow instructions and a bio bag for the sample. Once completed, the One Health testing kits ship with express postage back to the lab, either directly from the individual in self-addressed prepaid mailers or by bulk shipping from company. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these kits allow employers to easily perform periodic testing of their employees to evaluate for COVID-19 exposure. Results are posted within 72 hours of receipt. One Health also provides a platform allowing the seamless management and tracing of tests. The platform comes with an easy to read dashboard outlining actionable next steps after testing. The platform supports compliance with applicable privacy and security requirements for the companies and their employees. Next slide, please. Through telehealth, we're able to screen and direct employees either to return to work, self-quarantine, or seek medical care as outlined in this diagram. Those with positive tests can be provided with thermometers and pulse, pop, I'm sorry, pulse oximeters to monitor their status. Mild to moderate cases of COVID-19 can be treated virtually as previously described by Dr. Blink. More severe cases will be referred for in-person medical care. And recommendations are done in alignment with the CDC's guidance. So thank you for your time. I now turn it over the discussion to uh, Diana Blaha to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, and thank you, uh, members of the esteemed panel. Lots of great information. Just a reminder for those on the call, please feel free to type your questions in the chat pane. We've got some good time available uh, left with us to answer these questions. So let's get started uh, right off the bat. Um, if you, one of the questions that came up is, if you have had COVID, do you still need to get the vaccine? Dr. Blink, can you take that question for us? Sure. Um, current recommendations are that, yes, you should get the vaccine. Um, I don't know if it's been worked out exactly in terms of timing, but the concern here is that for two reasons, number one, uh, there have been a handful out of over the whole world, but only a handful reports of people who have gotten COVID-19 more than once. Uh, we frankly don't know the exact incidence of this because the signature left behind by the virus is hard to decipher unless there's been a mutation. The other issue is that, in fact, there are mutations going on. So the better your immune system has been primed to be reactive, the better off you are. So um, stay tuned. I don't think we have this fully worked out yet, but at this point, regardless of whether you've had COVID infection in the past, it is currently recommended that you have the vaccine if you're able to tolerate it. Great, thank you, Dr. Blink. Dr. Kavanaugh, maybe I could toss one over your way. What is the recommendation for returning to work if you are diagnosed with COVID, still having some symptoms, but they're very minimal? Yeah, the, the recommendation is a, a period of quarantine, depending on when your symptoms start, and that you have to be asymptomatic uh, with no fever and no cough for at least 72 hours. Great. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to uh, toss one over to you. Is there any fear that the FDA will pull this approval? You mentioned it wasn't a formal, had gone through the regular process. Is there any fear that the FDA will approve, will pull the approval once the crisis or the immediate crisis is over? Um, I don't, sorry, I was pulling my video back on. Um, I don't see this being pulled anytime soon. The only reason I would see it being pulled is if there was some kind of crazy side effect, or adverse reaction uh, that's popped up so far. It doesn't look like there's been that much besides maybe some a few allergic reactions, but uh, you know, if we got to the point where COVID was fully controlled, which I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, theoretically that would disappear and they could pull that. But I would assume that by then they might just have a full FDA approval because it's probably going to get approved anyway. Um, it that 
criteria about the crisis doesn't ha apply to an approval. An approval, once it's approved, it's good forever, unless something changes that. So unless, like I said, unless that happens, I, I don't see it going away anytime soon. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Michelle, I know you answered this in the chat pane, but can you talk a little bit about uh, the list of presumpti presumption states? Sure, happy to do that. Um, we do maintain a fluid presumption list or legislative update list on Corvell.com. So I would point you to um, that list and that website to access that information. Of course, it's being changed not as rapidly as we were seeing early on in the COVID um, emergence, certainly it slowed down, but we do still continue to see states um, making changes to COVID legislation, whether it be work comp and or liability. We have seen some uh, legislation related to liability exposure. So check Corvell.com. And again, as we finish up also our investigation on uh, liability for mandatory vaccination programs and exposure under work comp, We'll also have our information there. Great, thank you, Michelle. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, a question came up. We're quarantining exposed employees for 14 days, but for CDC guidelines, it is shorter time. For example, 10 days recommended. Which do you think we should follow? Well, right now we're 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 recommending the 14 days um, from when they test positive. Okay, great. Um, Ryan, perhaps this is one that you can help us uh, kind of navigate through. There's been some negative information about the AstraZeneca option for the vaccine. Has this been overcome or what are your thoughts about that? Sorry, can you re repeat that question, please? Sure, no worries. Uh, there's been some negative information about the AstraZeneca option for the vaccine. Have those uh, concerns over been overcome? Um, negative in terms of it not working, or I know I know that doesn't have as high of a an efficacy rate so far. Um, some places say between sixty and seventy percent. I know that some of some of the trials have been stopped and then restarted because of um, some reactions, but it looks like everything has been fine and they've been still going. I think that one's probably the close, the next closest one to get authorized because several countries have started to authorize it, including the UK and several other ones. So I believe they have overcome any issues they've had so far. And I do expect that one probably will be authorized in the next couple months. Oh, okay, great. I was, another. I, I was, excuse me, I want to add another um, comment on that last question. If someone has been exposed to someone with COVID 19, the, the quarantine period is seven days and then retesting. I'm, I'm sorry, the 14 days if someone is tested positive. Um, so they're, they're slightly different uh, uh, tracks that they're on. Great, thanks Dr. Sage. Dr. Blink, a question came up. Should you get tested again if you've already tested positive once? Uh, good question. So currently the CDC recommends that once you test positive on a PCR test, you should not be tested again for three months. And the reason, the reason for that is that PCR is an amplification um, that each cycle doubles the number of strands of RNA that's converted to DNA that is detected. So after 10 cycles, you've got a thousand fold increase. After 20 cycles, you've got a million fold increase. So it's an extremely sensitive test. And for people who've had the virus but have recovered and no longer have any viable COVID in their bodies, their cells may still be shedding RNA. Basically, it's dead RNA, but the test will still pick it up. So if you test somebody, a month after their infection, you may show a positive test, but it doesn't mean anything, just causes confusion. So you should not be tested again for three months after a positive test. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Blank. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh, I know you talked about uh, home COVID testing as uh, through our telehealth program. Um, and I know there's other companies out there that are offering home testing. But specific to your knowledge and based on what we're providing at Corvell through telehealth, 
can you talk a little bit about the cost of the kit, the cost, it, whether the cost is passed on to the employer or to the patient or any of those kind of details to share with the group? Um, I really don't know the exact cost of the kit. Um, I think that if it's some companies are going to buy it in bulk to distribute it to their employees um, and some will have the kits sent directly to the employees. So uh, the employees um, would not be paying for the testing. It would be going through their employer. Um, and depending on the quantities, I think that's, I think that those things are, um, you know, done through marketing. I don't know that the details of the prices. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, fair enough. And I think some of those, I, I, I know Dave Lipinski is on the phone and I know he's been working uh, feverishly to try to get everything in place. So perhaps more details to follow, Dave and Dr. C. I'm going to assume thumbs up on that one. Yeah, more details details to follow on that, Diane. And again, for for the ones that are going through work comp, it would be paid to the claim file, um, and it, it's it's going to be around a hundred dollars. That's the short of it. Thanks, Dave. At least it'll give the uh, the participants an idea of what they can expect. Yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot there, but good questions and good answers. So, um, Michelle, I know you work a lot with attorneys, especially because California is such a hotbed. But do you have any thoughts or have you gotten any information on when case law will, uh, information will be available? Uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, to be determined. It's going to be very jurisdictionally specific, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and we're just now seeing the early stages of emergence related to COVID-19. Um, predominantly, I would say, um, and unfortunately, on the GL side or on the liability side. So uh, risk factors. Uh, failure to notify, failure to provide a, a safe environment, those kinds of things. We're starting to see some litigation around. There have been a number of death cases, um, kind of a serious and willful, again, failure to protect, failure to provide PPE, et cetera, that are emerging. But again, not very much yet. I suspect it'll probably be really closer to uh, Q2 or Q3 of 2021 before we see much in the way of true litigation. I can tell you that nationally, attorney uh, groups um, are drawing together and putting together some strategic plans and on how to approach this. And certainly from a defense standpoint, we'll try and distribute information as that becomes available to us as well. Right. Yeah, it feels like we have a lot of crystal balls and a lot of uh thoughts, not sure on a lot of facts on a lot of these questions. So appreciate best guess at this point. Ryan, can I um, flip it back to you? Based on your knowledge, based on what you're seeing, how close is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to approval? And any um, thoughts on um, what the expected effective rate is? What are you seeing from the uh, initial studies? I don't know if I've seen an exact date yet on when it's going to be approved or authorized. Um, I know it's in phase three trials right now, and it's probably going to be, I'm guessing it's going to be a little bit later than the AstraZeneca. I, I have seen preliminary reports that it's up to 95% effective too. Um, it's a one shot. That's a huge advantage, just having one shot instead of two. Um, so that will be a big difference as well. But I definitely think that it will be coming up soon, hopefully. And when you say soon, are you thinking within the next couple of months, within the next couple of days? I'm gonna I'm gonna guess within the next couple of months. I mean, it might be okay. January or February. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Dr. C, this is kind of an opinion question, but I let me toss it over to you. Should a business mandate a vaccine or recommend that their staff get the vaccine? Give us a little bit of your thoughts on pros and cons. Well, you know, I think that varies by state and there's, there's a lot of uh, legal debate out there about whether you could mandate the uh, vaccine. And, and from what I'm seeing, they're starting to uh, lean towards that it is possible for employers to mandate. Although um, the, the cons on that is that it is a um, emergency use authorization vaccine. And so there may be pushback that you're asking employees to take something that is not um, FDA approved yet. So um, I think if someone uh, decides not to get the vaccine, it would go under FMLA and you'd have to see whether you can uh, reasonably accommodate their, um, I mean, under the ADA, I'm sorry, 
and whether you could reasonably accommodate them if they do not have the vaccine. Well, that raises another great question, and I'm going to toss this one back to you, Michelle. Due to the presumption in California, if an employer mandates the vaccination and then a, an employee has a reaction, could it be a work comp claim? Absolutely. Uh, California has very broad, um, number one, presumptions, and number two, it's, as anyone who operates in the state knows, it's a very liberal um, umbrella for compensability. I do not think um, it would be unlikely that it would be workers' comp if it was required or mandated. And I will tell you, we have seen other reactions to vaccines or boosters occur and be filed under workers' comp, specifically in California, which is where I sit physically, and those have been found to be compensable. So, again, mandatory boosters, NMRs, situations, um, for generally healthcare providers. And again, they had a reaction to the vaccine booster, filed a work comp claim, it was found to be compensable. So California specifically, I would say yes. Great, thank you, Michelle. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Blink, maybe you can help us address this one. Is the COVID vaccine going to be a yearly vaccine like the flu vaccine, or do you think it's a one and done? Remains to be seen. Um, the duration of, don't forget, the vaccines have only been, even in uh, clinical trials, for what is it, eight months now, I think. So that's, a, that's the longest timeline we have to see how long these um, actually maintain immunity. And the best way to track immunity at this point is by looking at circulating antibodies. However, there's two different kinds of immunity in our bodies. One is circulating antibodies, which actually physically neutralize the circulating virus. And the other is the cellular immunity system, which is a completely separate kind of lymphocytes. And that cellular immunity, there's not just a simple blood test you can take for it. So we believe that after your circulating antibodies drop in about three months, you still maintain the cellular immunity so that you've got this memory. That's why you want the second shot, so you can develop the cellular immunity memory. And we just don't have a good way of measuring that. I mean, there are ways, but these are very sophisticated research lab tests. You can't simply order a test and say, do I have cellular immunity? So the answer is we don't know yet. It's especially given the fact that we have seen mutations and the fact that we do see this rather significant antibody drop after about three months, it seems likely that this may need a booster shot on a periodic basis, whether that's a year, two years, 10 years, we don't know. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Dave, can I put you on the spot? Dave Lipinski, who uh, uh, manages our virtual health program. If We've got some interest of folks who are wondering how do they sign up for uh, providing the vaccines through telehealth if they're presented with COVID systems with uh, COVID symptoms. Can you perhaps give us a little bit more detail on that for folks on the phone and how they should get involved in that? Yeah, it's actually not through dispensing the vaccine. This is for potential exposures. I'm sorry. Yeah, yep. and so what, so what we do is it's obviously triage through uh, our triage program. They'll go into telehealth, so it's all done virtually. Um, we can prescribe and, and, and get, ship them the DME, again, the pulse oximeter, the thermometer, so we can track them to make sure that uh, symptoms aren't escalating. And that's where they'll actually have their tests mailed to them. It's more of a collection kit, and then they can mail the, the, uh, the kit back um, to be to, so we can uh, look at the results and assess next steps. So for any clients who are interested, just reach out to their Corval rep, Dave? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's something we've just started, so we're happy to have a discussion about turning this on for your specific accounts. Great, thank you. Dr. Kavanaugh, a question comes up. After someone is exposed, how soon would they be eligible for the vaccine? After the, after they're exposed to getting the vaccine, I, I already meant you mean testing. After they've, after they've already been exposed to COVID, they haven't gotten the vaccine. Should they get the vaccine? And if so, how soon afterwards? Yeah, we what, what they're, um, the, I don't know what the recommendations for that is. It's the, if you have been exposed and you're starting to have symptoms, um, 
and you're in a high risk group, at that point you would you could recommend them for the antibody infusion. Um, if you've just been exposed, we would uh, start testing and usually it would take about, the average is five days to start seeing a positive test. And you would send them a pest test kit to see if they turn positive. Um, I don't know anything about giving prophylactic vaccinations at this point. And I don't, I don't see that on the docket at this point. Fair enough. Um, Dr. Blink, what are your thoughts about um, making the vaccine mandatory for healthcare workers? I don't believe that's in place today, but do you see it going in that direction? Well, it, it is in place in some places already. Um, so, you know, an employer um, can choose to require their employees to be vaccinated. That's already been determined to be um, a legitimate action by an employer. Then the decision as to whether they're actually going to do so is one that balances the employer's risks and benefits for having workers who are protected versus the legal risks of employees who may be unhappy about it or may have a bad reaction to the vaccine. So uh, can a healthcare employer require their employees to be vaccinated? Yes. Uh, and as Dr. Kavanaugh stated, um, if you have somebody who does not get vaccinated or who maybe can't because of medical issues, then you're going to be dealing with another situation, which is can you accommodate their non-vaccinee status? But also, as um, was stated earlier, the requiring an employee to get vaccinated almost certainly throws any side effects of the vaccine into the workers' comp realm, whereas if it's voluntary, uh, it's going to be a case-by-case -case, um, case law decision rather than um, an almost certainty. So um, this is the developing area. I don't think we know the exact answers as to how this is going to develop. Great. Um, well, I've got you here, Dr. Blank. Um, a question came up, how many mutations are there so far? Is the vaccine ready for those mutations? And what are the side effects or risks of the vaccine, which I think we've already talked a little bit about, but maybe if you could just recap again, that would be great. Yeah, so um, currently, as far as we know, all the vaccines that are either approved or even in development um, have uh, efficacy to all the strains that are out there. And the reason is that when you're presenting um, the spike protein, so all, all of these vaccines are based on the spike protein, all five of those that are candidates right now. They have different delivery systems to get them into your body so that your immune system will then react and create immunity to it. But the spike protein itself has changed very, very little with all the mutations we've seen. The British mutation, for instance, has 23 mutations since Wuhan, but only one of those actually affects the spike protein structure, which is the part of the virus that actually attaches to the cell. And as far as we know, it does not change the affinity for that spike protein to the antibodies that your body produces. So your body produces not a single molecule that fits like a lock and a key. It's a whole big keychain of molecules that might fit. So our bodies are actually pretty smart about this. And so far, that's not an issue, but it certainly could become one. Great, thank you. Brian, maybe a, a little bit more of a pharmacology question. Um, is, should people with allergies get the vaccine? For example, if someone has severe penicillin allergic reaction uh, and they've had it in the past, um, and, and maybe some angioedema reaction to other medications, should that person um, consider either one of the vaccines or wait until something is less reactive comes to be or any thoughts on that? Um, I think you really want to look at just, I mean, there is probably someone who's more allergic to things in general might be more alert, have a high risk for it. But what they're really seeing are, I know like in UK, the people who've had really bad allergic reactions have had bad allergic reactions to maybe vaccines in the past and other ones. Um, it might be the spike protein. It might be one of the inner inactive ingredients in it. So it's definitely something that you know patients to discuss with their doctors or their healthcare providers uh, to see that because that's just something to be aware of. But I mean, just because you have an allergic reaction to penicillin antibiotic doesn't mean you'll have an allergic reaction to the vaccine because it's such different molecules. But like you said, some people are had 
just more likely to have an allergic reaction to certain chemicals in their body. So it's definitely something to be aware of if you're getting it. And perhaps have this discussion with their family physician. Yeah. Great. Um, if, I, if I may. Yes, Dr. Blank, go for it. I, I thought it'd be important just to say that um, so far, the immediate hypersensitivity reactions that we've seen to the uh, Pfizer and the um, Moderna vaccines, uh, we're not sure what the component is, but it probably is part of the lipid layer that envelops the RNA. And for people who are allergic to that, once you have an allergic reaction, which we're seeing some kind of a reaction, roughly one out of every 400 uh, vaccinations might be less. This is a small sample um, that we've seen in our institutions. But once you have a reaction, you should never take that vaccine again or its relatives. So neither of those. However, the three that are following on that we hope will get um, approved, they're just regular vaccines. They're just live viruses, which are like a whole lot of other vaccines, should not cause you trouble. And the one is just the spike protein itself which is not the cause of the reaction. So this is a very peculiar situation just for, for those two vaccines. Thanks, Dr. Blink. And a good question that you raise, why do some people not get COVID even after being exposed? Um, <laughs> well, the virulence of a virus or any infectious agent depends on a lot of factors. First, how good is the virus at entering the body and then entering the target cells? Second, how big was the dose that you got? And third, how robust is your immune system in fighting it off? So those are factors with the virus, factors with the environment, and factors with your own um, immune system that are highly variable from person to person. So there's going to be a bell curve and some people are going to be more susceptible than others. Some situations are more dangerous than others, just like any other disease. Yeah, definitely. If we knew all those answers, Dr. Blink, we certainly would be rich folks, wouldn't we? <laughs> uh, Dr. Kapanoff, can you help uh, the audience understand why it's important to both maintain social distancing and wear masks once the employees have been vaccinated? Um, so we, once you've been vaccinated, um, you still can, um, well, they're not, it's not, it's not, they're not sure yet, but it's believed that you may still be able to, um, be a transmitter, a trans, I guess that that's the wrong word. <laughs> you may still be able to transmit the virus, uh, through your, um, uh, breathing, so through your nose and mouth. So it's important to keep your nose and mouth covered so that you don't you don't shed the virus uh, if you're exposed, and then you know continue the the cycle of uh, the the spreading. So they are still recommending that even after you get the virus, that you continue to wear your face mask and and uh, practice vigorous hand washing so that you don't continue to spread the virus. Uh, things healthcare professionals have been telling us for years, right, Dr. C? Same thing. Same thing. Well, I've got you. Do you foresee employers and or passports travel, uh, travelers to make it mandatory in getting the vaccine for the future? That's a good question. Um, I mean, there has been talk of that, um, talk of carrying a card or something like that, but um, I, nothing has been finalized at that front, but there is a lot of talk about that and giving people a vaccine card showing that you've been vaccinated. We'll have lots of cards for our wallets and purse between TSA, global <laughs> entry and vaccination, right? <laughs> yeah, but it, you know, that that's not, that's not been put in place yet. It's just so talk right now. Gotcha. Uh, Dr. Blink, if one of our clients or one of the audience members as essential workers, non-healthcare, how do you suppose or any thoughts or recommendations or do you even know how to possibly get them higher on the vaccination list? Um, hopefully, <laughs> um, you know, this Good is gonna question. vary from state <laughs> to state. Yeah, this is gonna vary from state to state. The um, prioritization of vaccine release has been delegated to the states. Uh, there's no overarching federal policy then within each state, depending on how they've got it 
um, sliced and diced, it may then devolve to the um, different counties or to different um, subgroups within the state, say healthcare workers, um, essential workers, those over 75, those with underlying health conditions. It's a hodgepodge, uh, it's a patchwork of different uh, systems in each state. So how can an employer uh, move their own employees up? Well, I think it would depend on who the employees are and where they fit in that state mandated hierarchy. Um, and uh, you, you'd have to check out exactly how that's being done within your state. Um, you know, one of the um, silver linings here is that uh, we should have enough vaccine for those who want it um, in relatively short time, two, three months, maybe not, maybe not until June for otherwise healthy uh, young people who are, have no high risks. Um, so on the other hand, we're going through the worst of it right now. So I can understand the desire of people to get the vaccine as soon as possible. Uh, one thing to consider when you're talking about the vaccine and risks in general is don't forget, we are now at a level where we're almost a thousand times higher prevalence of the disease in the population than we were back in March and April. So even though the vaccine has 95% efficacy, meaning you're dropping the risk by 20, a thousand times divided by 20 still means we're 50 times higher risk now than we were in March and April, even if you got the vaccine. So you're still going to need to wear your mask, wash your hands, stay six feet away, clean surfaces. So true. Thank you, Dr. Blank. Um, Ryan, a question came up. Who can give the shot, the vaccine, besides a doctor or a nurse? Who can give it? Yes. Um, I mean, right now, I think any healthcare professional that is qualified to give vaccines can give it. Um, I know a lot of, you know, doctors' offices can give it, nurses can give it, pharmacists can give it, probably pharmacy interns. Um, I know in my field, a lot of um, you know, CVS and Walgreens and all these companies right now are trying to hire a bunch of pharmacists to do this. Um, they're put, they're setting up vaccine clinics everywhere, whether it's nurse, anywhere that can get it. A lot of nursing homes right now. Um, once it becomes more widely available in actual pharmacies, they'll be you know they'll be giving it there too. So I know they've been expanding um, people who can give it. I think I saw in some state they just authorized dentists to give it. So they're they're. They're authorizing more and more healthcare professionals to give this thing to, you know, get it widespread. So there really will be a lot of options, especially when it becomes available to everyone. Absolutely. I think you and I talked about, uh, I heard on the news last night, North Carolina is calling in the National Guard to help with the administration of the vaccine. Uh, of the vaccine. So, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I think uh, essential people are definitely needed, right? Yeah. Michelle, I'm going to pass this one over to you. It's kind of more of a comment, but perhaps you've got some thoughts on it. Um, we've already responded to 10 OSHA complaints regarding COVID-19. Uh, the complaints of, have all been staff not, not distancing, not wearing masks. All have been resolved in this client's favor. Have you seen any of this or you have any thoughts on that statement? Um, I actually have, again, um, I'm going to speak and I'm, I'm not trying to isolate California, but that seems to be of where I've seen a preponderance of activity is with Cal OSHA. Um, we are seeing some fines and some assessments in California. They are targeting, it appears to be some specific industry, again, care facilities, uh, some manufacturing locations where there's, of course, a large number of employees and areas where there has been complaints. So, um, you know, my recommendation is, again, stay close to your employees, uh, make sure you're open and transparent that you have a policy that's being followed and um, updated. And if you have violations that you're addressing those and documenting those internally. Um, and, and again, reach out to your local uh, employer representatives or counsel to um, provide you with updated information. I think uh, now in 2021, this is going to be a significant area of focus for OSHA across the country. So we're going to start to see more and more of that again, some directed specific industries, some because of complaints um, that have been issued by employees and in some states because of re mandatory reporting um, that is occurring to either OSHA or to the local healthcare department. So again, 
this is the time definitely to step up. If you have maybe not been as aggressive with your compliance and follow up and programs, I would say uh, this would be the time to step up those efforts. Reach out to resources. We can provide you with some information as well as far as contacts jurisdictionally and are happy to do that. Um, but yes, we, we are starting to see some significant assessments and fines being levied right now by OSHA. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, we, we figure if we can tackle California, we can tackle any state, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's usually the worst. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, um, some of the things that we hear on the news is that um, some of the vaccine is expiring or it's not being stored properly and is uh, then no longer valid or, or uh, effective. Um, it just seems we don't have a good solution. Do you hear what the solution might be and, and um, how we can get the vaccine out faster and, and more efficiently? Well, the, um, the, the Pfizer vaccine is, is, um, has to be reconstituted. And once it's reconstituted, it can only last for five hours in the refrigerator. The Moderna vaccine, uh, once reconstituted can last much longer. And so I think most of the problems have been with the Pfizer vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine also, once it's reconstituted, has to be uh, gently uh, agitated. And that, that, you know, there are problems with not agitating it correctly, where there are par particulate matter in the, in the vaccine, which makes it inert. So the Pfizer vaccine is a bit more touchy than the Moderna vaccine, and I think that is where the majority of the problems uh, have been. Also, each vial that's reconstituted contains five doses. So if you have a set number of people coming in and some people are no-shows, you would then could waste up to four, you know, four doses if you re reconstituted a vial for that last person in line. So, um, and you, you don't have that problem with the Moderna because that will then still, you know, stay in the refrigerator for a longer period of time. Um, and also the fact that the Pfizer has to be kept at, at the sub-zero temperatures. There's not many facilities that have the capacity to do that. So um, it, they've been having more issues with getting that out. There have been, I guess there was one case where someone sabotaged doses, but that's, uh, that's a whole different issue. Yeah, isn't that the truth? My goodness, you wonder about their um, mentality. But anyways, that's beside the point. Um, Dr. Blink, it, it is kind of a, a head scratcher. Do you have any thoughts as to why some healthcare workers are declining um, the vaccine when offered? My crystal ball is cloudy on that one. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, I, 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 look, it, it's a brand new entity even amongst um, vaccines that have been out there for decades, there are skeptics, partly because of that unfortunate incident 30 years ago where there was a British researcher who falsified his results, made people believe the vaccines were dangerous, even though they're not. I mean, there are real risks, but nothing like what people believe. So you've got that underlying problem. And then on top of that, this is a, a, a brand new entity on the world, you know, and usually it takes many years for a vaccine to go from development to actually winding up in the public's arms. So people are a little bit skeptical. Uh, I personally am not. Uh, I, I think it's important to realize that in fact, these have gone through full phase one, two, and three clinical trials. We have a good picture of what the risks and benefits are. And once we give it to hundreds of millions of people, will we find other things? Yes, we will. There's no doubt about it. But comparing risks is something that humans are actually not very good at. And we have to remember that comparing the risk of a vaccine against the risk of not getting the vaccine is not something against zero. The risk of not getting the vaccine is you're going to get COVID-19. And if you wait long enough, everybody in the world is going to get this thing. It is not going to just go away until we reach herd immunity, and we're not sure that's ever going to happen. So basically, it's only a matter of time, I think, before people will either get the vaccine or get the disease. And any risks of the vaccine are far preferable to what the very known, very real, and very serious risks of COVID-19 are, even for people who are young and otherwise healthy. So as to why they're doing it, I think it's 
um, just general skepticism and uh, and early adoption problems. Um, but uh, uh, it, it needs to be encouraged. We all need to get it. Thanks, Dr. Blank, and thank you for your crystal ball reading. It's always appreciated. Um, we're coming down to the last couple of questions. If you have any questions um, before we sign off, please put them in the chat pane. Um, but Ryan, one more question for you. Any thought as to when children under the age of 16 will be approved to receive the vaccine? Yeah, so um, the initial trials, um, Moderna or Pfizer Moderna only studied people 16 and above or 18 and above. I have read that they are doing further trials in um, children. Uh, they're going to do one soon. I think they just started one with children 12 and above, and then they're going to do more later in the year. So I would anticipate that um, probably mid to late 2021, we might know more about its efficacy in children. Those emergency authorizations can always be expanded or changed. So if they do studies and they find that it's you know it's fine in children, they can always expand it to children by expanding the age group. But until then, we just really don't know. So I would anticipate hopefully mid to late 2021, maybe we might know more. Great, thanks, Ryan. And then last question, maybe I can talk to you, Dr. Kavanaugh. What type of PPE should be used in a residential facility with COVID possible uh, positive clients? I, I think the same PPE that we're all wearing around, which is the face mask. Um, and in, in, in those facilities, they also have gloves because they're going from patient to patient. So they would have to change their gloves uh, between patients. Um, it's also recommended that they change their face mask every three hours. Um, and um, you, if, you, if a person is actively sick and you're treating a, a sick person in the uh, ward, you could also uh, don, don a gown um, and a face shield. So uh, it depends on you know whether the the what level of care that you're giving, right. but the minimum is a, um, is a is a face shield. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, and then I think if Karen Thomas is still on the phone, maybe I can just I, it was mentioned uh, that we need to keep injured workers active, especially as they're recovering from COVID or they're waiting for their treatment or their surgeries. Uh, to take place, and we want to keep them in condition. Karen, can I just give you a, or ask you to give us a, a quick blurb on what we're able to provide from Corval Case Management Clinical Services? Oh man, Diane, you set me you set me up beautifully, right? Uh, so <laughs> we uh, have partnered with Peerwell. Um, to offer our patients who are waiting perhaps for surgery that's been delayed, uh, the ability to participate in a prehab rehab app um, that addresses five pillars of health to keep them fighting fit uh, prior to surgery so they're ready to go. Um, that app also offers a back pain program that can assist them with overcoming pain. And of course, we have a cadre of nursing services to ensure that we can get the injured worker um, any number of, of services that they might need uh, to address their overall health, which is really critical in this crazy time of COVID. Um, not just their physical well being, but their mental health well being that's going to affect their ability to uh, return to work uh, appropriately and quickly. Thanks, Karen, and thanks for letting me put you on the spot. Great response. Well, that's it for all of our questions. Uh, we thank all of you for joining our call today. A special thanks to our panelists who are both um, bring so much knowledge, talent, and crystal ball to this discussion. So thank you each and every one. Uh, thanks, Matt, for kicking us off. And please be safe. Have a great rest of your day. As we said before, this has been recorded. We will be able to provide uh, information about this webinar to you within the next couple of days. Stay tuned, or please feel free to reach out to your Corval representative. Thank you all, and make it a great day. Thank you, Diane, and all our panelists, and thank you to all of our attendees today for your attention and participation in today's webinar.